Hello everyone, in this video we'll be covering chapter 15, Monetary Policy. This is kind of an extension of chapter 14 in a way. We'll be diving a little bit deeper into the monetary policy goals, the choice of policy targets, how monetary policy is illustrated in our supply and demand model, and we'll also look at some monetary policy related to economic activity. So let's go ahead and get started. So first, what is monetary policy? Well, in chapter 15, we talked about how it is, excuse me, in chapter 14, we talked about how it is carried out by the Federal Reserve Bank. The Federal Reserve was created in 1913 and its main responsibility at that time was to prevent bank runs. So after the Great Depression in the 1930s, Congress gave the Federal Reserve more authority and broader responsibilities to promote specific goals. These included maximum employment, stable prices, and moderate long-term interest rates. So since World War II, let's just make a note of this really quick. Active monetary policy since World War II. So the monetary policy, the definition is the actions that the Fed may takes to manage the money supply and interest rates to pursue macroeconomic policy goals. So what are these goals that we're talking about? The four main goals of the Fed are price stability, I just mentioned some of these related to the Great Depression. High employment. We have stability of financial markets. I spelled that wrong. And institutions. And then our fourth one is economic growth. So we're going to talk about each of these in turn. The Fed's number one goal is our first one here, price stability. So price stability is important because when prices rise, the value of money is impacted. So rising prices decrease the value of money as a medium of exchange and store value. And so we want to make sure that price stays stable so money can function effectively. When fly, when high inflation occurred in the 1970s, the chairman at the time, Paul Volcker, he focused primarily on fighting this inflation as his top policy goal. And that's why to this day, price stability remains the most important goal of the Fed. Okay, let's talk about employment. So again, going back to World War II near the end, Congress passed the Employment Act of 1946. This was to, quote, promote maximum employment. So the responsibility of the federal government was to foster and promote conditions under which there will be afforded useful employment for those able, willing, and seeking to work and to promote maximum employment production and purchasing power. So goals one and two, price stability and high employment, those are called and often referred to as the dual mandate of the Fed. Okay, 
let's go ahead and highlight those two since they are pretty important. So Federal Reserve goal number three is stability of financial markets and institutions. These are essential. The Fed makes funds available to banks during times of crisis, exhibit A, COVID, in order to ensure confidence in the banks. This also occurred in 2018 when discount loans became available to investment banks to ease liquidity problems. And then finally, goal number four, economic growth. Really, we want to focus on stable economic growth. There's a qualifier there. Because stable economic growth promotes long-run investment. That's necessary for overall economic growth. And although it's not super clear exactly how the Fed can encourage long-run investment, the focus is mainly doing that through our three goals we talked about earlier, price stability, high employment, and stability of financial markets and institutions. So the question becomes, you know, how can the Fed go beyond, you know, focusing on these previous three goals to promote long-run investment and long-run economic growth? So there's been thought that potentially... Congress and the president may be in a better position to meet the goal of economic growth, but it's up for debate still. Okay, so let's talk now about the money market and the Fed's choice of monetary policy targets. So the three tools we introduced earlier are open market operations, discount policy, reserve requirements. So you should have read about those in chapter 14. And these tools are used to keep unemployment and inflation rates low. And it does that by influencing two specific monetary policy targets, those being our money supply and the interest rate. So we have two monetary policy targets, the money supply and the interest rate. Again, we're trying to keep unemployment and inflation rates low. Okay. So how does the Fed influence these policy targets? Again, the money supply and interest rates. So these two targets are actually related. Higher interest rates result in a lower quantity of money demanded. So you're like, okay, what does that mean? All of a sudden, now we're switching to a graph. Okay, let me explain it like this. So interest rates are high. Remember, interest rates are the return you're getting when you put your money into an investment, right? Or into the bank. So when interest rates are high, alternatives to holding physical cash look attractive, right? You may decide to invest or put more money into savings or buy treasury bills, potentially. So when interest rates are high, alternatives of holding cash are attractive, so opportunity cost is higher when interest rate is high. So rather than actually stashing cash under your mattress, if interest rates are high, you might decide, hey, I can get a better return on my money by putting it into some type of investment. So that's why we see here a downward sloping demand curve for the demand of money. So let me write that out. When interest rates, little i, are high the opportunity cost of holding money is also high. 
So if the opportunity cost of holding money is high, quantity of money demanded is lower. Okay, so we can see this relationship I just explained here on the graph. So again, at a high interest rate here, our quantity of money demanded is going to be lower than if we were at a low interest rate. Okay, so now that we've explained why the demand curve for money is downward sloping, let's talk about shifts of the money demand curve. So what can cause a curve to shift? The change in the need to hold money to engage in transactions would cause the curve to shift left or right respectively. So one example of this would be if more transactions are taking place within a country, so a country has a high real GDP, there's a lot of consumption and investment activity, research and development potentially, new houses are being built, then the need for money is higher for each transaction. So the demand for money will be higher if there are more transactions taking place. Increases in real GDP would shift the demand curve for money to the right. Decreases in real GDP or the price level decrease the money demanded. Okay. So we've talked about money demand and as we always do when we talk about demand and supply, we eventually have to talk about supply. So let's talk about the supply of money. So in the previous chapter, we saw that the Fed can alter the money supply by buying and selling treasury securities through open market operations. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to go back and review chapter 14. But to increase the money supply, the Fed is going to buy those securities. Again, if you don't understand, it's really important for you to go watch the extra videos in chapter 14 specifically related to the worksheets. So when the Fed buys securities... They are, in exchange, pushing money out into the money supply and increasing the money supply. Sellers are going to deposit the sale proceeds in the checking account of the Fed and the money is going to get loaned out, which increases the money supply. Decreasing the money supply requires selling securities. So let's draw this out on a graph. We're going to assume the Fed can't completely or can completely control the money supply, and that's a big assumption. So if they can completely control the money supply, then the supply curve would be a vertical line. It does not depend on the interest rate. Again, this is just a model. So in this case here, where does equilibrium occur? It occurs where the two curves will intersect. So when the Fed increases the money supply, the short-term interest rate is going to fall until it reaches a level at which households and firms are willing to hold additional money. So we can see here in our first illustration that when we shift the money supply curve to the right here, what is happening to interest rates? Interest rates are going to fall until Households and firms are willing to hold the additional money. Remember, high interest rates make people not want to hold money. High interest rates make people want to invest their money, put it in savings, etc. So let's look at the alternative situation. Alternatively, if the Fed wants to lower the money supply by selling securities. So they're selling securities. That means they are taking money out of the supply in exchange for those securities. Now households and firms are going to hold less money than they want relative to other financial assets. Interest rates are going up. And so we see that our quantity demanded 
of money is going to also go down. So in order to retain depositors, banks are going to have to offer a higher interest rate on these accounts because firms and households are now wanting to hold less money. So we're not going to get too much into it, but there's two interest rate models, the loanable funds model, which talks about long-term interest rate, and the money market model, which is what we're talking about right now. The money market model focuses on short-term nominal interest rates, and it's more relevant for the Fed because changes in the money supply are, in this model, directly affecting interest rates. Here we can see that when the money supply shifted right, interest rates went down. When the money supply shifted left, interest rates went up. And again, we're doing this through open market operations. Okay, so how does the Fed choose a target for a particular level of the money supply or a short-term interest rate? So they can choose either, if they concentrate on the interest rate, then essentially they are looking at the relationship between the money supply and real GDP growth. There are a lot of different interest rates within the economy, and the Fed specifically is going to target the federal funds rate here. Federal funds rate is the interest rate banks charge each other for overnight loans. The Fed doesn't set the federal funds rate, but it does try to influence the rate through changing the supply of bank reserves and participating in open market operations. So if the Fed is able to influence the federal funds rate to decrease during recessions, this encourages high employment. And if it influences the federal funds rate to increase during expansions, that would encourage price stability. So although they're not setting the federal funds rate specifically, they are actively trying to influence it and control it through the open market operations and adjusting the money supply. So there are some new policy tools we're not going to get too much into, but what happened after the Great Recession was that bank reserves increased significantly, which limited the Fed's ability to raise interest rates through open market sales. So the Fed started paying banks interest on their reserve holdings and the interest rate it pays essentially sets a floor on the federal funds rate. So if federal funds rates were lower than the interest rate on the reserve balance, banks would be able to borrow funds in the federal funds market, deposit them at the Fed, and then earn a risk-free profit. So in, even though the actions were not necessarily costless, the effective floor is below the interest rate on reserves. So sometimes the Fed, instead of conducting open market operations, engages in per repurchase agreements. So the Fed may buy a security from an investment bank, financial firm, and then it promises to buy it back the next day, the respective financial firm, investment bank, etc.
a reverse repurchase agreement would do the opposite. So it would be essentially borrowing money from that financial firm overnight. So the Fed uses tools like these to influence the Fed funds rate and all of this happens in a split second via computers so we don't actually necessarily see these transactions occurring because they're constantly happening and constantly being reversed okay so let's move on to our next section monetary policy and economic activity so the ability of the fed to influence these economic variables, including real GDP, it uh, depends on its ability to affect long-term real interest rates. So if we're going to assume the Fed can affect long-term real interest rate using the Fed funds rate, we can look at how interest rates affect aggregate demand respectively. So again, I want to make the note that we're going to assume Fed can affect long term real interest rate using our Fed funds rate up here. So how do the interest rates affect aggregate demand? Well, we've kind of looked at this before. We can see that it will affect consumption, investment, and net exports. So lower interest rates, we've done this before, encourage credit use, which will raise sales of durable goods as far as investment goes again lower interest rate encourages investment big i stocks and new residential investment are more attractive. So we see this going on right now. Low interest rates coupled with stimulus checks are making the purchase of new homes very attractive. Finally, net exports. High interest rates, we're taking the converse look. High interest rates, they attract foreign funds. So if the U.S. has high interest rates, foreigners are like, hey, we should invest in the U.S. to get that higher return. So what will happen? Our net exports are going to actually fall due to exchange rates. Okay. So now we've kind of talked about some of the stuff we've discussed previously. Let's talk about expansionary versus monetary policy. So using the tools we've talked about and understanding when the Fed conducts specific policy based on where we're at in the business cycle. So Expansionary monetary policy, this occurs when the Fed takes ac action to decrease interest rates and increase GDP. So if we're trying to decrease interest rates and increase GDP, then what do we see happen? So I went ahead and illustrated it here for you. Originally, we were at point A. If we're at point A, we want to go towards long-run equilibrium. Long-run equilibrium is where what? 
all three curves are intersecting. So how do we do that? We need to shift the aggregate demand curve to the right. And how do we shift the aggregate demand curve to the right? We would need to decrease interest rates to raise consumption, investment, and net exports. So affecting the interest rate, we can increase these three components to affect aggregate demand, and that would move us back towards long-run equilibrium. So we see here, if we're at point A and we're moving here to point B, oh, there we go. So we need to move towards point B. We see that our GDP gap here. So remember, going down here, we can see our GDP gap. We are in a recessionary gap at that point. So when we're in a recession, the Fed conducts expansionary monetary policy in order to move us back towards macroeconomic equilibrium because our real GDP is less than our potential GDP could be. Okay, so this is when we're in a recession, right? What happens if the economy is producing above potential GDP. So you might think, hey, well, that's a good thing, right? Like we're, we're out producing um, our potential. Well, not exactly. So what happens when we start to outproduce our potential? There are other issues that start to arise. Remember, the Fed is concerned with long-run growth and inflation is a danger to long-run growth. So what happens is if we are constantly shifting our aggregate demand curve to the right, um, consumption's going up, investment's going up, things are getting really hot, we have also what? Increasing price levels. So we saw here in our first example, what are we doing? We're moving from A to B and we see what? Price level going up. So price levels rising discourage long-run growth so we want to make sure we have price stability which is why we would conduct monetary contractionary monetary policy so with contractionary monetary policy we need to increase interest rates which would cause consumption investment and net exports to fall and that would shift our aggregate demand back towards our potential gdp full employment, long run aggregate supply curve intersection with the other two curves, which is our macroeconomic equilibrium. So let me just highlight the important part of that. So we need to increase interest rates to decrease inflation. We wanna focus on long run growth long fun growth uh, clearly i made a little typo here long run growth and contract the money supply to discourage inflation and maintain price stability so the fed will have to use open market operations potentially to contract the money supply okay so now let's go to our final page here and talk about whether or not these types of policies can are actually effective in completely mitigating recessions. Well, unfortunately, they're not completely effective. Completely offsetting a recession is not realistic. The best the Fed can hope for is to make recessions milder or shorter. We see here our little business cycle graph and let's talk about a proposed scenario, right? So if a recession began in August of 2020 and the Fed found out that, hey, we're, we're looking like we're in a recession, you know, GDP is falling, things aren't looking as great as they were, there's a lag between when the recession actually starts and when the Fed realizes they need to take action. So in June of 2021, the Fed will start monetary policy, expansionary monetary policy. But what happens if the recession had already kind of started to end and things are recovering? Well, 
if the Fed continues to keep interest rates low, if they do that for too long, they're going to encourage real GDP to go beyond potential GDP, which can potentially cause overheating within the economy, a bubble. And that's what we saw during the years before the Great Recession. We were seeing bubbles in the housing market, for example, and there was also a lot of underlying instability as far as regulatory environments. People were taking unnecessary risks, and so that also contributed to the recession. But you can see here that sometimes the Fed doesn't get its timing perfect, and that can cause the business cycle to start to swing out of its normal rhythm. So another complicating factor also that I want to note is that current economic conditions are rarely known. We can only know them once they've passed, and so that's why we have a lag. And so what is the result? It's higher inflation and the next recession will be more severe. So slide 34 has a really good diagram on understanding monetary and fiscal policy. Excuse me, understanding monetary policy, expansionary and contractionary. I'm getting ahead of myself. Fiscal policy is until the next chapter. But this talks about the steps as far as what happens um, without monetary policy. We're not going to get into the aggregate supply and aggregate demand dynamic model. Again, shifting one thing is enough. We don't need to start throwing in shifts of the long run aggregate supply curve. If you want to flip through those PowerPoint slides, you're more than welcome to. But I do want to talk a little bit about the setting of these monetary policy targets. Again, in normal times, the Fed tries to influence the federal funds rate, but another alternative would be to target the money supply. So why could it potentially target the money supply Instead, so monetarists, which were led by Milton Friedman, they think that the Fed should target the money supply. They advocated for a monetary growth rule, which said that increasing the money supply at about the long run rate of real GDP would essentially make sure that we stayed stable versus doing an active counter cyclical policy, which he thought Friedman, I'm referring to, would destabilize the economy. This theory was pretty popular back in the 1970s, but people think, economists specifically, think that uh, the link between money supply and real GDP may not necessarily be true right now because money supply seems to be all over the place and real GDP and inflation aren't reacting in the same way. So again, lots of different theories about how to fix things, but if someone had the exact right answer, we wouldn't still be talking about all of these different theories. So the Fed can't target both the money supply and the interest rate because they're linked through the money demand curve. We talked about this. So if they targeted both, we would see that we can't be increasing the money supply and also targeting the interest rate because they're both linked together. So a decrease in the money supply will increase interest rates and an increase in the money supply will decrease interest rates. Okay, back to where we were. 
So let's talk a little bit about the Taylor Rule. It was developed by John Taylor, Stanford University. It links the Fed's target for the federal funds to these different economic variables. So it included specifically the current inflation, equilibrium, real Fed funds rate, inflation gap, and output gap. So what are these things? The inflation gap is the difference between current inflation and the target rate of inflation. Output gap is the difference between current real GDP and potential GDP. Essentially, it's going to weight the inflation and output gap by one half to indicate relevant relative importance the Fed places on these two specific variables and during Alan Greenspan's tenure as the Fed chair these metrics and this specific rule was a fairly good predictor of the federal funds rate but it's kind of been all over the place since then so again may not be perfect and is not perfect. What about inflation targeting? So this idea is that essentially if we conduct monetary policy, we should announce a specific target level of inflation through the central bank. And this has been adopted by a lot of the countries in Europe, but the usual outcome of this targeting appears that inflation is lower, but unemployment is temporarily higher. And again, one of the goals is to have what is the goal the goal is to have high employment rather than having higher unemployment so in 2012 the fed announced a target inflation rate of two percent per year And there are arguments for and against inflation targeting, just like there's arguments for and against a lot of these different theories. And there's pros and cons. So finally, we have our liquidity trap related to Fed policies during the last Great Recession. Um, I'm not going to get too much into the Great Recession just because... Y'all can read that on your own time, and there's a lot of differing opinions as far as who triggered it or what triggered it specifically. But I do want to talk about what a liquidity trap is. That is when you reduce the federal funds rate to the point where they can't push rates any further to encourage investment. So remember, if we're lowering interest rates, that tends to impact our consumption, investment, and net exports. However, what happens when you get to the point where, you know, interest rates are at zero and people still aren't willing to consume and invest, then what do you do? Do you start paying people to consume at that point in time? Again, so liquidity trap is something that people don't think about when the Fed funds rate stays at a low rate. So it's kind of one of those things where your backup plan is to lower interest rates to encourage investment and shift aggregate demand, but at some point in time, you can't do that anymore. So you got to figure out what to do or not get to the point where you're stuck. So that about covers everything I want to talk about in chapter 15. Hope this video was useful. If you have further questions, please let me know.